Harvard Divinity School. Why invite her here? Her voice is Ora, the female voice in vocal nudity debates in northern Nigeria, November 18th, 2021. I'm, my name is Ann Browdy, and I'm the director of the Women's Studies in Religion program here at Harvard Divinity School. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture from Dr. Rahina Muazu, who will be speaking to us today about the female voice and vocal nudity debates in Nigeria. I'm so pleased to be able to welcome uh, Rahina's friends and family and colleagues from Jos, Nigeria, as well as from Berlin and London, as well as our entire audience throughout the United States and elsewhere and all the friends of the WSRP. Thank you for joining us for today's very special lecture. I hope you all had a chance to hear uh, Dr. Muazu chanting and reciting the Quran in our intro um, uh, music, which yeah. was such yeah. a wonderful treat. Um, I am gonna ask everyone in the audience to mute your audio and also to use the speaker view, which will give you the, uh, the most effective view of today's presentation on Zoom. Um, this will be our last lecture for the fall semester. We hope to see all of you again in February when uh, we look forward to Heather White's lecture on the Church of the Holy Apostles that became the epicenter for New York's gay organizations following the Stonewall riots in 1969. Uh, and then in April, we will be uh, hearing from Zat Jamil, who will tell us about Islamic self-help and gender disciplining in contemporary Singapore. Um, but today it is our privilege to hear from Dr. Rahina Muwazu who, as you heard, in addition to being a scholar of the Quran and Islamic studies, is herself a, a, both a reciter of the Quran and a teacher of Quran recitation to women. She uh, started in uh, learning to recite at a young age. She went on to gain her bachelor's degree in Islamic studies from the University of Jos, And she then went on to the Aga Khan University in London, where she got her master's degree in Muslim cultures. And finally, um, she received her PhD in Islamic studies, magna cum laude, from the Free University in Berlin. In Berlin, she studied the uh, what the Quran says about women's voices in reciting the Quran. Um, in her master's degree, she did ethnographic research on female Quran reciters in Jos. The project she's working on here with us at Harvard, and which she has published several articles about already in peer-reviewed journals, brings these projects together to look both at the experience of women Quran reciters and at what the law uh, in the Quran tells us. So without further ado, let me um, turn the podium to Rahina. Um, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> I'm, I mean, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Tracy, for your kindness and for making things go smoothly here. Um, I'm so thankful to my colleagues here at the WSRP and to family and friends and colleagues joining from different parts of the world. Um, this is really a special day for me. So today, I'm, as, as a visiting scholar at the Harvard Divinity School, I'm giving a public lecture considering that uh, about two decades ago, my main wish and hope was to be able to, uh, to be allowed to complete a se secondary school education, which is an equivalent of a high school here in the US. So I'm so grateful for today. I'm so grateful for the enormous Harvard resources I have access to, 
I'm grateful for being in the midst of this wonderful, brilliant and kind scholars. Um, so I would like to share my screen now. Um, yeah, so the, the title of my talk today is Why Invite Her Here? Her Voice is Aura, the Female Voice and Vocal Unity Debates in Northern Nigeria. Um, so I will be referring to uh, Northern Nigeria, or I mean, I will be referring to it as, as, as Hausa Land, as you can see on the map. Um, and when I say that, I mean the, the northern part of Nigeria, roughly here. I don't know if you can see me pointing to the area and the southern part of Niger, which was uh, historically a group of uh, kingdoms situated between the Niger River and Lake Chad and whose main area uh, were colonized by Britain and France and led to the creation of modern day Nigeria and Niger Republic. And Hausa is a language spoken by the people, the, I mean, many of the people there who are overwhelmingly uh, Muslims and, and Sunnis. Um, so there, the lecture today revolves around uh, the perception of the female voice as part of a woman's aura. And aura is an Arabic word that is translated as uh, nakedness, genital organs, uh, private parts, genitalia, blemish, defects, and so on and so forth. And on the Islamic law, the term has been used uh, to refer to a part of a body of a male, female, child, or even former slaves that should not be exposed to those who should not see it. And in the Quran, aura has been used uh, differently, it appears differently in different contexts, ranging from private parts uh, to times of private privacy and spaces of vulnerability. And also several hadiths refer to aura in terms of prohibiting a man from looking at the aura of another man or a woman uh, from looking at the aura of another woman and vice versa. So what I want to do today is to give a general background to my research and then link it with the perception of the female voice in Nigeria, where the research is based uh, through the activities of uh, two female preachers. Um, so what does the idea of a woman's voice as aura even suggest? Uh, it means that uh, the voice of a woman is part of her nakedness or nudity and could cause temptation or fitna when revealed. Therefore, it should not be, it should be covered. And covering the voice means taking the voice out of the public space. So for instance, I, I consider my hair as part of my aura, that's why I'm covering it. So if I consider my voice as part of my aura, then I have to cover it, meaning I would not be speaking uh, to a public audience of mixed gender involving men that are not uh, related uh, to me, the غير mahram. So I will uh, say something more about that. Uh, so it's very important at this stage to mention that the Quran do not uh, clearly say that the female voice is part of her aura. However, while addressing the wives of uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the Quran 33, 32 does refer to their female voices. And it is this verse that has formed the basis for varying and conflicting understandings on the legal position of the female voice in the public space. So as we can see, we have the verse here on the screen, which says, Ya Nisa al-Nabiyyi, lastunnaka ahadim min al-Nisa'i, in ittaqaytunna fala takhda'na bil qawl, and the English translation I have here from Mohsin Khan says, O wives of the Prophet, you are not like any other woman. If you keep your duty to Allah, then be not a soft speech, lest he in whose heart is a disease uh, should be moved with desire, but speak in an honorable manner. So the word used in the verse is khada, which can be translated as submit, give away or surrender. And is the clause 
in the verse that contains the prohibition. So it can be translated as do not be soft in speech, do not be deceptive uh, in voice, or do not make your voices lenient. And this verse has been interpreted in various ways by leading classical exegetes of the Quran, such as Abu Jafar, Muhammad ibn, uh, Muhammad, uh, ibn Jaril al-Tabari, Ibn Kathir al-Qurtabi, and others whose works are widely studied and cited in, in Nigeria. Um, so while uh, my research is on Northern Nigeria, I focus on two sites. I want to mention something, uh, something briefly about the sites I work on. Uh, so that the city of Jos and Kano, which I have shown in the map, and Kano is a large predominantly Muslim state with more than 20 million inhabitants with a centuries old tradition of Islamic learning and home to Sufi, Sufi orders, the Qadiriya and the Tijaniya. It's also among the 12 Northern states that re-implemented the Sharia in 1999. And Jos, a relatively small city compared to Kano, was founded, so that's where I was born and raised. It was founded in the early 20th century as an economic base for the British. And it's also, uh, you know, it has a multi-religious uh, population, a good reputation for good climate and deadly ethno-religious crisis. But what's important for my research is that Jaws is the headquarter for the Muslim group Jamaat Izalat al Bida al Qamat al Sinna, uh, which is translated as the Society for the Removal of Innovation and Reinstatement of Tradition. So here I'm using the translation of the name by Professor Usman Ken uh, from his book, uh, Muslim Modernity. Uh, so I would like to also talk briefly about my positionality within Izala and also uh, in the field. Uh, so as I said, I was born and raised in Jers um, and that's the headquarter of Izala. And as a child, I was educated in one of Izala's Islamic schools and trained as a Quran reciter. I later joined the national Quran competition representing Izala and my state and won many competitions. And my parents are also Izala members. And my father, who was and still a very influential figure, has sponsored some of Izala's projects. So on the left here in the photo is my father here. And here on the, sorry, on the right here is my father. And here is the founder of Izala, Sheikh Ismail Idris. And in the picture, my father was given um, the document of a school he built for Izala, which is up to today one of the largest schools owned by Izala. So here uh, you see the photo of the school, which has uh, which captures only part of the school, not all of it. Um, so um, the debate, okay, I'm going back to this. So the debate on the aura of the female voice was brought to the forefront when Izala, who had been very influential in boosting female religious education, uh, and still is in so many ways, withdrew from the Nonfodia competition named after the 19th century reformer that established the largest uh, Islamic caliphate in West Africa. So the Nonfodia competition is the body that brings together all Muslims from Sufi and Salafi groups to participate in Quran recitation competition. Right. Izala, Izala withdrew, given some reasons which include their perception that the judges of the four-year competition were biased to Izala members, and the assertion that the coming together of both men and women to attend those competitions leads to immorality, and the exposure in public of the aura of the female voice. So of these three reasons, it is the last one that resonates most strongly with many ordinary Izala members. They feel that the female voice in recitation is part of a woman's aura and should not be heard by a non-related male. So that's the Ghair Mahram. And a Ghair Mahram under Islamic law is a, a, someone that is allowed to, someone a woman is allowed to marry. So why, why does it matter? Um, why does a research on aura of the female voice matters? Uh, it matters because it is connected to the perceptions of uh, the religiously and socially acceptable roles a woman can play in the public space. Uh, so to put it in an interrogative form, can a woman give a public lecture like what I'm doing here? Should she be allowed to read the news on TV or on the radio 
Is it appropriate that she sings a poem in praise of the prophet? Can she make the call to Adhan? So the, the answer to all this depends on the way in which the voice is understood. And building on that, uh, part of my current project here at the Harvard Divinity School is to focus on the theological side, looking at verse 33, 32, which I have shown on the screen, which is the only verse in the Quran that refer to the female voice and how it's, so I, I want to study that and how it's been interpreted. And on this, I want to build on the work of uh, Professor Amina Wadud on the hermeneutics of Tawheed to emphasize how the unity of the Quran permits all its parts. Uh, so rather than simply applying meanings to one verse at a time with occasional reference to various verses elsewhere, a framework as Wadud pointed out, may be developed that includes a systematic rationale for making correlations and sufficiently exemplifying the full impact of Quranic coherence. Um, so, however, for, for my lecture today, I have chosen to focus on the ethnographic side of my research on two female preachers in Northern Nigeria in the cities of Jos and Kano who publicly argue that the female voice is not part of her aura. And the data I'm working on is based on participant observation and interviews I have been conducting since 2011. So Malema Khadija that we see here on the left, um, she, and Malema Zara, well, I will introduce her later, both present Ramadan tafsir, so Ramadan reading and interpretation sessions, which is a space where Quran is recited and then translated into Hausa language. And these two preachers rose to prominence through the publicity generated by the audio and videos of their tafsir sessions. And what was the offer to men, to women, but also men, which adds the body of the literature, but in this case, purely oral on, you know, the literature on female interpretation of the Quran around the globe. So this Ramadan Quran sessions uh, give rise to forms of what I call here a woman's engagement with the Quran. And majority of the female preachers underpins what male scholars and preachers have said either about reinforcing traditional roles or pushing for more women's rights within the paradigm of Islam, whatever they understand that to mean. The second, as in the case of Malama Khadija, uh, so she's, you know, she, I think she might even be, uh, she might be in the audience. So it involves women pushing even harder in their translation and sometimes interpretation of the Quran and in issuance of fatwa. So I want to focus on her and how she, underst she understands verse 33, 32. Uh, so as I have said, it's the only verse that make reference to female voice in the Quran. Asuma Lema Khadija, she's an outstanding scholar who, whom I have interviewed on several occasions. I've also attended her public talks in Ramadan Tafsir, and since 2007, I have been following her religious and community activities. She's a mother of six. She, she, has, she was trained in traditional Islamic madrasa and has a bachelor in Islamic studies at the University of Jos. And she has worked with many NGOs, participated in various local and international uh, research projects. And she's now a peace commissioner for the Kaduna State Government. So the whole title of my today's lecture stems from a conversation I had with her some few years ago. In 2018, Khadija was invited to give a lecture at uh, the graduation, or graduation ceremony of some Nigerian uh, army officers. And it was one of those occasions to which she was usually invited, not only due to her vast Islamic knowledge, but because she speaks fluent English. And English being Nigeria's official language is the medium of um, communication in those avenues. So Khadija delivered her talk successfully, after which a male scholar stood up, took the microphone, and addressed the organizers about how disappointed he was because a woman was, uh, had, uh, was invited to address men. And uh, after he had finished, Khadija asked for permission to respond, which she was granted. So she started uh, by citing a long hadith of the female companion of the prophet called Asma bint Yazid al-Ansari. 
uh, Asma was a female companion uh, and she went to the prophet uh, as, as a representative of other women to ask him about Islam. And the prophet listened to her. She talked to him in prison of his companion. So he listened to her after which he commended her speech as a beautiful speech of a woman asking about the affair of her religion. So after citing that hadith, Khadija told them, if Asma could address the prophet and his companion who are better than you, why can't I? So I have had Khadija refer to this incident, to the hadith of Asma and to the Quranic verse of uh, 33, 32, several times to argue that um, her voice is not aura. Uh, so for her, this reference is very significant because she uses it to always reject the idea that her voice and the voices of other women are not aura. And second, by employing the hadith as her reference along with, Quran, uh, with, with the Quranic verse, She's reconceptualizing, as I argue, she's reconceptualizing the image of a righteous woman, which we call in Hausa, we say machetagari. So I argue that through this, through the public usage of her voice, she's reconceptualizing uh, that image of machetagari, who is culturally understood as a pious and quiet woman, to a pious woman who is very vocal and assertive. And the attempt to stop Khadija, which has happened to other female preachers, such as the wife of the famous male preacher, Sheikh Amini Dawrawa, and to me as well, is not only the result of a difference in fatwa on vocal nudity, but, it, but is uh, connected or linked up with the exercise of social power, the discourse on the production of the female voice as a cultural category, and reifying women's voices as spaces of religious uh, configuration. Um, so one second, I want to change uh, my slide. So, but now I want to um, um, give you an idea of how the Nigeria's um, uh, public sphere is for those that are not familiar with it. But first I want to make reference to this work on the screen. So the female voice in House of Land is uh, carefully and discursively constructed over a long period of time. And just like uh, Miyako Inua, so the book we see here on the screen observed in the case of Japan, House of Women's voices are socially powerful truths. So we say in House of Yende, Kamata, Matasi, Magana, or the way women should speak has been a space of, uh, a space of discourse in which women uh, are sometimes objectified, condemned, staged, or normalized. And statements such as uh, women should speak politely or women always speak foolishly and illogical are prevalent. They are part of daily experience. So I still remember vividly how as girls, it was carefully cultivated in my sisters and I, the right way a real woman talks, Machetagari talks, and stories of Kanuru women in northeast uh, part of Nigeria who are said to win anything, just anything from their husbands by using their sweet and entertaining voices um, has also formed part of our journey into womanhood. And mothers have, have been charged with the responsibility of preparing their girls for matrimony and teaching them not only marital skills, but also the language to sustain the marriage. Um, so, but, um, okay, I think I skipped uh, one slide, one, one important slide. Okay, I'll just keep with this. But women's voices is also a theme. So one of the themes, one of preaching themes, for example, the leading Izala figure, the one we see here on the screen, Asha Kabiru Gombe, in his lecture on halal love charms has not only taught um, his female audience how to seduce their husbands using their feminine, elegant, uh, sexy voices, but has also mimicked the voice. And this careful engendering of the manners and sounds of the female voice to attend the status of Majetagari is continually taught at homes and on preaching podiums, not only by Sheikh Kabiru Gombe, but by others, such as the example I will give below. Um, so now I want to, uh, Sorry, yeah. So, but as I have mentioned before, um, so I want to give you an idea, especially those that are not familiar with the context. So I want to give 
the audience an idea of um, you know the Nigerian public space, so that uh, those that don't know the context will not imagine it as a space where the female voice is completely uh, absent. Uh, so the female voice is definitely not a stranger in Northern Nigeria's public space. Uh, we see important works of Beverly Mack and Jim Boyd uh, and other scholars portray the public exposure of the female voice in Houseland. And the former work, this one here, Women Sing, is on the singers and performers of, uh, of the 20th century, such as the famous Barmani Chogi and Binta Katsina. I grew up listening to Barmani Chogi on Radio Nigeria Kaduna and have seen how her songs, uh, particularly Akama Sena Amata, motivated secluded women to seek crafts. Uh, and trade within the confines of their homes. And these singers were succeeded by Kani Woodhouse cinema female singers such as Binta Labaran and Khairat Abdullah. And even though the latter, along with uh, other Kani Wood artists, claim they educate their audience and give moral lessons, they are heavily criticized as corruptors of the house of culture and morality. So whatever effect they may have, both singers like Barmani Chogi and Fatih Niger are hardly considered role models for Machetagari. However, other works of Mark and Boyd, so like this one's here, they, and even uh, the scholar Mure Last, uh, so they portray the other side of the exposure of the female voice in Houseland. As a princess scholar and poet, Nana Asma'u, who is the daughter, she died in 1864 and she was the daughter of Dunfordio. She had taken up the role of educating Muslim women in the 19th century. And the network of women she created known, known as the Entaru, so translated uh, sometimes as the associates, they traveled throughout the caliphate taking education to fellow women in the forms of poems. They publicly sung and chanted. And this vocal role of Nana Asma and the Entaru is what sometimes Malama Khadija links her activities with to demonstrate that she can also use her voice. And uh, because Nana Asma is the Machetagari par excellence, so it's also easy through her to, to reshape the, the image of uh, Machetagari. Um, so now I also want to touch briefly on uh, the other female preacher, uh, Malema Zara. So she's here in, she's this one here. And uh, she's in her 50s, she's married and a mother of seven and has a PhD in Islamic studies and, and house from Bayero University, Kano. She's been in the field of preaching for more than two decades and has been very, uh, very, she had taken very influential positions such as her current role as the Commissioner of Women Affairs and Social Development, and also served formerly as the female commander of the Islamic Force Hezba, the Hezba Shara office in Kano. So it's a religious office, um, uh, a religious police force responsible for the enforcement of Sharia established with the re uh, implementation of Sharia in 1999. And although Hezbollah's uh, jurisdiction is limited as we remain under the Nigerian police force, uh, the scholars heading it have enormous influence. Uh, so Malema Zarao's position at Hezbollah is a significant move in the feminization of religious authority in Nigeria, as existing literature highlights in other places such as Senegal, Niger, and Cote d'Ivoire. And along with her tafsir, so that's the Quran interpretation station and the media, her position at Hizba has played a significant role in helping Zara gain public exposure and also establish herself as a religious leader. Um, so I interviewed uh, Manama Zahrao and Sheikh Dawra, the male commander at Hizba uh, in their Hizba office in 2006. And I asked them what they think about the female voice and verse 33. 32, and both of them believe that Quran allows women to speak publicly and does not imply that the female voice is aura. They stated that the focus of, of, of the verse is on vocal, is not on vocal nudity, but on prohibiting women, women from sexualizing their voices, which is also prohibited for men. So like Malema Khadija decided uh, historical references to betray their points, they mentioned how women a narrated hadith orally how the prophet commanded uh, uh, Muslims to take half of their religion from his wife Aisha. 
And based on this position, uh, Mala Mazara, who uses her voice publicly during her preaching sessions and also for her current uh, role as the Commissioner of Women Affairs. So the theme of her sermons revolves, so her preaching, they revolve around marital relationships, focusing on male superiority and women's obedience. And it's important to mention that outsiders will hardly consider her preaching sessions to exhibit women's full agency when, when agency is defined in terms of uh, resistance to male authority. So for Malema Zahra, for instance, her rhetoric states that uh, men as superiors should protect and provide and women as subordinates should be submissive and respectful. And if this balance is maintained, a good, mar a good marital relationship and a good society will be achieved. And you know, whenever there's a problem with the balance, she usually she blames she blames women for either negligence in the area, which is obedience, or kirsa. And the latter kirsa is understood as a feminine technique in which women have a unique feminine power to seduce all men, so in this case, husbands, and pursue their agency. So on Dakirsa, women's voices take a special place in her preaching sessions. Uh, for instance, she once preached, uh, she says a woman's voice should be elegant and sweet like the voices of women of paradise, which when the man, that's the husband, hears, entices him. And so this kind of alluring voice which entices the husband is, as she explains, a critical or a crucial character, uh, like part of a part of piety as well as uh, the expected means by which uh, a righteous woman trains herself to be more pious. So upon this notion, uh, Mala Mazara who conceptualizes Machitagari as a woman who obeys her husband, who obeys her mother-in-law, who cooks well, who adorns herself when well, is welcoming to the husband's family and friends, and who, if she works, protects her dignity at her workplace, and who is both uh, clean, both in body and speech. And this cleanliness in speech, Sabtar Harishi, it is, is discursively forming um, the female voice as a cultural category while also portraying it as, you know, in a binary uh, distinction, both as a, as a part of a woman's aura, but also as a form of uh, obedience uh, to husbands upon which spiritual reward is expected. And in this context, the female voice Zahra would describe above should not be confused uh, with the voice which she uses uh, during uh, public preaching because the former is understood as a feminine voice and the latter is for the public, both of which uh, she presents, uh, both of which are um, like legally, Islamically allowed for, uh, for a righteous woman to use. Um, so now I want to go back to to the question I raised earlier. So why does it matter? Um, so before Izala uh, withdrew from that m year competition, I was already married off. I was not only uh, a married teenager, but I was a teenage mother. And when I heard that Izala had set up its own public competition, and girls will not be allowed uh, anymore to participate at the state and national competitions, but only boys. I remember feeling very angry. And I remember I had a hypothesis and it was that the rise of the female reciters and memorizers of the Quran of those belonging to Izala will decline because one of the main incentives for the girls was the competition since women do not perform a public role uh, that uh, recitation is expected such as the role of, of imams um, and two decades later this is exactly what is happening and even though there is an increase in women's visibility in religious leadership in higher education not only in nigeria but in various places across west africa as many studies have shown within Izala members, there have been a decline in number of reciters and memorizers. And even, even though at the same time uh, in Nigeria, there has been an increase in number of female reciters uh, belonging to non-Izala groups. So as I look back 
I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit amazed at, at, at how as a teenager, I could see this coming. Uh, so I was saying, you know, when the news reached me, I felt angry and I thought about the opportunity it, uh, public recitation was given women. And by this, I, I'm concentrating on the ability, the public exposure, the ability for women to use their voices publicly. So the kind of opportunities it gave me, it gave all the girls the social and economic benefits. And this is completely exemplified in the lives of these uh, non isara female reciters who continue to recite publicly which is what I analyzed in my doctoral dissertation using the theory of the forms of capital by the French sociologist, uh, Pierre Bourdieu. So I look at how public recitation, how the ability to use voices publicly uh, was, you know, and, and through the award, the money award that the girls received allowed them to not only travel, but to own cars, to own houses, and to have a strong network and they are even symbolically crowned as the queens of the Sokoto Caliphate. So in concluding this lecture, I want to go back to the questions I, I was raising on the aura of the female voice. At our uh, WSRP um, colloquium some few weeks ago, my brilliant colleagues helped me on having a clearer view of my research which is that I'm attempting to write a larger story about Islam and female authority from a positionality informed by Hausa culture, as women in the Hausa society, like in other contexts, struggle to be heard. And using the notion of the aura of the female voice and the centrality of language in producing gender norms, I'm exploring whether women's voices could be heard as people's voices, not as sexy voices. So Heather, one of my colleagues, uh, called my attention uh, on how my work connects uh, fundamentally to a question in gender theory and especially in the work of Judith Butler, which addresses how societies determine which people are women, therefore submissive and sexualized, and which people are men, therefore dominant and not sexualized. And in looking at the general debates on vocal nudity, in Nigeria and outside of Nigeria, usually the scholars are unanimous that the female voice is aura when she speaks with a seductive or deceptive voice. And it's forbidden, haram, for a woman to speak with a seductive voice in the presence of a non-related male. And the female voice becomes nude, so it becomes aura if listening to it could lead to fitna, could lead to temptation. So what is largely left out of this discourse is whose intent matters, the person speaking or the person listening, and how will the interpretive process be different if it proceeded from the assumption that women are people? So Heather's comment suddenly made me understood a question I have been dealing with for many years. In the debates on Aura, one of the questions that the classical jurist raised was whether the female voice feel asil, they say feel asil, whether the female voice feel asil is Aura, that whether the voice is inherently Aura. And by this, now I understand, so now I'm feeling that I, it's even now that I'm understanding the question, not even the answer. So I understand that what they were asking if, is uh, if the female voice is inherently a person's voice, a human voice, or a sexy voice. And a human voice is definitely under the law. Just, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, a human voice is just a human voice. It's just a person's voice. And so what I'm thinking is, if, is, is, a, is a woman's voice then a human voice? And from these, I'm deducing that if a woman is a human, should she not then have a human voice? I believe the whole interpretive process will have been different if it started with the assumption that women are simply human beings, they are simply people. Um, yeah, so I'll just say something and not, oh, sorry. I wanted to say something about the photos, but I, I think I went out of my slides. Uh, yeah, so the photos you've seen are a combination of mine and also photos from uh, Noura Al-Ghali, who is 
who has been very helpful and supportive actually, and he's the national coordinator of the M4D competition on social media. Yeah, so I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Rahina. Um, this is so illuminating and inspiring and um, uh, I know it's going to have a lot of repercussions um, and I'm especially gratified to hear how useful the conversations with other research associates have been for you because I know we've learned so much from hearing about your work. Um, let's see, I will take, um, we are going to take questions. Please post your questions in the chat. Um, and we have about 15 minutes for questions um, from this brilliant lecture. Uh, the idea that what this really boils down to is the question of whether, theme, whether women are human beings, whether the female is, is also human um, or simultaneously human uh, is such a fundamental and significant question. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, coming to this conclusion. Um, uh, let's see, there are, I don't see, a uh, lot of people in the chat are talking about how brilliant the lecture is, but they, I don't see them posting questions yet. So, um, let's see if there's a question for you, or if I will get to post the first question. Um, I guess one thing that I would love to hear you speak a bit more about is how the question of women's um, engagement with the Quran also figures in this discussion of whether women are human beings. And are, are women, is there a problem with, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen in the history of the Women's Studies and Religion program is the importance of uh, having women qualified to comment on their scriptures and uh, really immersed in the, the theological questions in the way that you are. Um, it, is this, does women's engagement with the Quran have a similar set of dynamics to the issues you've raised about women's voice? Um, so thank you, Anne. Um... So this is, this is a very important question and a difficult one, but I will limit myself definitely to the context I'm working on to Northern Nigeria. We have many women since I, I would say from the last two decades with the women's increase in uh, their increased participation in institutions of higher uh, Islamic learning. So they also go into their activity of um, what we call the Ramadan Tafsir program. And it's a space where they, so we usually have uh, two women, one reciting the Quran and the other one translating it. So basically mm -hmm. what they do there is translating the Arabic Quran into the local language of Hausa. But since translation is in itself also an act of uh, interpretation because one has to make sometimes choices at least the word choice which one to choose and each one has a meaning it has an implication so in that sense uh, they are also in a way interpreting the quran but generally as i have mentioned their interpretation is for the overwhelming majority repeats what the gender norms are what is accepted because they are, they're so afraid to cross the limit, really. Mm -hmm. So one scholar that is, and she's the one I introduced, Malama Khadija. So she's the only one so far that I have seen trying to push that limit, trying to engage and trying to sometimes even offer a contradictory fatwa that is not you know, um, agreeable by the majority of uh, the male scholars. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Anne. <laughs> well, yes, it does. And it, it leads to some of the other questions that are starting to appear in the chat about how women can uh, advocate for women's voice to be acceptable 
um, while simultaneously advocating for female obedience. And one question in the chat asks if she misunderstood um, that the woman who is advocating for women as public speakers is also advocating for female obedience in marriage. Um, do you want to clarify that point? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So she's the second preacher I, inter I, uh, I introduced, uh, Malama Zahra'u, uh, which I also find very interesting. She's very popular, very influential. She has this, you know, the Hezbah office is this religious uh -huh. office and she's the, she was, her time has ended now. So she was the female uh, commander. And uh, so there's, she's definitely advocating and in her, you know, her rhetoric is you, men are the, uh, they are the superior, they are the providers and women are subordinates and should be obedient. And whatever that is faulty in the society is because that balance is not uh, observed. Um, so she's definitely also, on the other hand, advocating for at least a uh, woman's usage of the voice in the public, that the female voice is not aura because she's also using her voice publicly to translate the Quran into Hausa. And she's also currently the commissioner for women affairs and social development. So it's, it's tricky, really. It, it, it's really tricky. I mean, I'm also from the context, but sometimes I look at these double positions and I'm trying to understand and, and you know, uh, make the two come together. Yeah, but I also, I mean, um, I think what they are doing, it's still very important. Even though they have to go with their majority, they have to go with the accepted gender norm. They have to also go with what is understood currently as a, you know, what I'll borrow here, uh, Joseph Hill's time, reserved feminine piety. So there's a certain way a woman is expected to be pious. And even though if, the religion allows her to be pious in different ways. What is, you know, accepted by the norm, you know, she has to go by it. So sometimes I think because they don't have much room to negotiate, so they just take what they have and they make best use of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope I'm able to also navigate <laughs> an, an answer. <laughs> I, I, I think that's very well put, and that tells a lot of women's history um, <laughs> around the world. Um, I just, oh dear, I just lost it. I wanted to share a comment um, in the chat from Dr. Celine Ibrahim, who's a, a graduate of our school, uh, who is the, the Muslim chaplain at Tufts University, and she says that she encounters this issue even in the United States in her role as a chaplain and scholar. So it's not just in Nigeria or just in any uh, particular location. Um, I'd also like to share a question from um, your colleague, uh, Zat Jamil, um, who asks, uh, she, she says, I love how you showed that the women were insisting on reciting not in order to subvert, but in many ways to affirm conceptions of obedience, as you've explained. And she asked, could you explain how Amina Wadud's hermeneutical approach has been useful in your analysis? Um, so thank you so much, Zad. And thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Yeah, I'm so glad to see you here. So um, Zad, uh, that's a very good question as well. So what I'm trying to do is, uh, you know, the hermeneutics of Tawheed, the hermeneutics of unity is to, as uh, Wadud Klali uh, pointed out, uh, is to use it to show or to demonstrate the full Quranic uh, coherence. So with particular reference to the verse on vocal nudity, which I have shown on the screen, which is verse 33, 32, so before, if one goes to the, what is called that the, the, the suburb and Nuzul, the occasion for the revelation, we'll see that they, they are what I call a set of seven verses. And 
the occasion for the revelation, why were the vices revealed, mentioned that they came as a result of, you know, there was a worldly increase or worldly demand uh, by the wives of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and then the vices came, they came addressing them. And then they, they said many things, you know, starting from um, uh, telling them how unique they are, how important they are, and, you know, giving them option. If they want to stay with the prophet, then they stay with him. If they don't, then he let, go, he, he let them go after, um, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the, the word now don't come to me, the English word. But then the whole message for me there is the most, for me reading it, the most important message in those seven verses is is that you are not, because it, you know, it says, it prays them as, you know, they live in the house of Nubuwa, the prophethood, where the Quran is, is revealed, and then it added that you are not like any other woman. So what I find um, very interesting is, even though the classical works of Tafsir, such as the work of Ibn Kathir, Tabari, Qurtubi, and so on, they differed in their interpretation. I mean, most of them, it's also very interesting that, that uh, most of those interpretations did not even make a reference to the female voice as bin Aura. Usually, this is something that came very, very recent. Usually they interpret the verses focusing on the wives of the prophet, but even if it's generalized to other believing women, there's this no focus on, you know, that the female voice is nude, is part of her nudity or nakedness. But still, I haven't come across any work of tafsir that consider this, these verses, you know, as a form of, you know, what what it suggested as a form of tawhid, as a form of unity. So I haven't come across any tafsir that focus not only on that verse that I showed on the screen, but on the verses that came before it and the verses that came after it. And I strongly believe that studying the verses, the set of only even the set of the seven verses, a careful study easily reveals that the main message of the seven verses is that the wives of the prophet are not like any other woman. That's why it says, if you do any good thing, you get double reward. And if you did anything wrong, you get double punishment. So what I want to start doing, uh, building on the hermeneutics of Tawhid by Wadud, is to start, you know, realize uh, studying those verses and trying to see, you know, what kind of wisdom I'll get from it, and then later connect it to other verses. This morning I was telling myself, like the next move, I'll take the Quran from the verse one to the end, trying to point out any verse that I think will add or would like make the seven verses come out, you know, in a more tawhid form giving it like more coherence. So yeah, we can continue the discussion that <laughs> later, but thank you for your question. Um, we're starting to get a lot more questions, so I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but um, so I may give you a few uh, and let you plug in where you would like to. Mm -hmm. um, one question is about, um, uh, whether the female preachers that you interviewed are tr are trying to push the boundaries of what women can do, um, and uh, maybe I'll just ask you to talk about that. But and then I want to, if you can do that quickly, I want to get to one more question. Okay, so the female preachers, I I mean, as I've mentioned, um, most of them are not actually, most of them are not pushing the boundary. So most of their preaching is a repetition of what is socially acceptable. But that's why I took the, the other preacher I presented, Malama Khadija, she's a very unique uh, preacher and she's so far, best of my knowledge, the, the only one I know that is really, really pushing the boundary and is, you know, she's, I mean, I give an example that my whole, the whole title for my lecture today is based on a, a conversation I had with her. 
where she went to give a lecture and then she was, you know, a male scholar wasn't happy that she was invited. So that kind of experience and more of her part, part, part of her, you know, frequent experiences. And she's usually not afraid to, to speak back like she did uh, when that happened. She went back to the podium, citing the Hadith, citing the Quran verse, yeah, so. Yeah, but most of them is a repetition of what is what is accepted, mm -hmm. already accepted. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I wanted to end with a, a question from Hawa Ibrahim, um, the the distinguished jurist who's also a past research associate in the Women's Studies and Religion program. And I'm not, I'm just gonna read the question. I, I am not sure I'm understanding it correctly. So uh, Hawa, if you need to make any clarification, you can, but I'll just read what you wrote here. Um, she writes, very proud of you and your work, Dr. Rahina. Um, just wondering if you could speak to Tafsir, Tafsir as if it's widely in the Northern Nigeria. If not, could it be? Do you understand the question or do we need to get some clarification? Not really. from Maybe one word was missed widely yeah. or widely word. So I think. Okay, Hawa, you have to try again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, can Hawa, me? can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, I, I unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, oh, can... yes, that, okay. I did, yeah. your name wasn't on the, um, on there. So yeah, go ahead, Hawa. Uh, but that was amazing presentation. So you spoke about um, Hajjah and the Tafsir in Kaduna. Mm -hmm. And in Umbe, where I come from, um, we don't have a lot of the Tafsir and women's voices, as you mentioned. And I was wondering whether my understanding is a little bit less. And if uh, you know of it, maybe if you can speak to that, but more important, how can we make those voices even louder uh, in the region? Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. So um, this is a very important question. So to start with the first part, we are increasingly having more women getting involved in these tough situations. I mean, I also in, a number of years I delivered the tafsir myself. So it's becoming more common, more women are doing it, especially during Ramadan, because that's the period when these sessions happen. And how to make the women, the, the, the women's voices more amplified. Hmm. That I'm afraid I, <laughs> I don't think I have the answer, but I think what is very important is to keep them more enrolled, more women to be enrolled in those higher institutions of Islamic learning, to know the religion, to have vast uh, knowledge. And I think that that is a good starting point. Yeah, I'm not sure I know how to amplify their voices more because it's, you know, it's it's not easy. It's 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 a challenge. <laughs> well, I think uh, that challenge is what we are so grateful to you for taking on. Where I I hope that uh, today's event has made some small contribution to amplifying women's voices, at least to amplifying one woman's voice that we're very uh, excited to hear from. And uh, it's great that we had other women uh, preachers and scholars and uh, others from Nigeria here with us. We're very grateful to that. We're grateful to Hawa Ibrahim for bringing her voice to this conversation. Um, and part of what I hope is that all the people who came together for this lecture will be able to support each other uh, and that, that that will amplify women's voices as well. So I cannot thank you enough for this wonderful and so illuminating and powerful and important 
uh, lecture that you presented today, Rahina. Thank you all Thank in the you, audience for, for joining us and um, providing the audience. Listening to women's voices is important as, as well. Um, and with that, I have I bid you all a good evening. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, to more lectures and to more scholars from Nigeria. So please, uh, please produce more wonderful women scholars that can come to, to WSRP. Goodbye to all. Sponsor Women's Studies and Religion Program at HDS. Copyright 2021, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.